Welcome back to this next uh, video lecture of the Knowledge and Data course. This one is going to be about entailment and inferencing. So basically we're now looking into the question of how can we make explicit the knowledge that is implicitly specified in the knowledge graphs. And for this obviously we need a language to allow us to specify more deeper expressive knowledge statements, knowledge axioms in the graph. And this is going to be the language RDFS that we'll introduce in a different uh, video. But first, let us look into the issue of how to derive new information in the first place. And obviously this is strongly related to the notion of semantics that we discussed in the last two uh, modules and the notion of entailment in specifically. So remember that we have uh, five answers uh, uh, to, to find in this course for specific questions. The first one is what should information look like if we want to use the web to share information between machines? And the answer to this was basically given in the first two weeks that uh, knowledge graphs are very useful formalisms and RDF is a good way to formalize this on machines. The second question is how can we use that information to answer questions? And Sparkle was an answer to this question. And now we have arrived at the question of how do we prevent miscommunication among different web-based information sources? Or in other words, how can we make sure that we have predictable inference so that whoever uses data and knowledge gets the same results out of it? The next module will be about the same question with more with a richer language to talk about knowledge. But in two weeks, we'll start with the question of how to connect and integrate different information sources. And the last question is left over for the project that you're going to do in the last two weeks, namely, how can we build applications that use this information? So remember that there were four proposals of things that we really need for the semantic web, a web of knowledge and a web of uh, data. And the first proposal was to give all things a name. And the second one that all these names should be addresses on the web. And RDF is an approach, an attempt to devise a language that uh, helps implement these two proposals. The third one, obviously, as well as the relation uh, uh, that is formed in a graph by the triple, uh, and again, RDF is here the language of choice. The fourth principle is to make the meaning of things explicit. And for this, we need languages that allow us to specify different things, more things than RDF can say, namely specific vocabularies that are always interpreted in a certain way. In other words, a vocabulary that comes with an, an explicit meaning that can be uh, help us to define notions of entailment and thus inferencing. And this is what this module is about, namely making explicit the meaning of things and about relation of things and uh, thus allow us to derive inferences, new things from implicitly, uh, implicit things from explicitly stated knowledge graphs. So the idea of organizing knowledge is not new and to make explicit the meaning of things. It's uh, several hundred years old. This is uh, Linnaeus who started to organize the world of biology by uh, ordering uh, species in hierarchies. So basically, there is an underlying model of information. You assign types to things, you assign types to relations, and then you organize the types in hierarchies. And this is what Linnaeus did. And based on this knowledge, these hierarchies, about the types of things you can algorithmically manipulate this knowledge and get new information out of what is specified. In formal terms, your axioms, your, your, your explicitly modeled information impose constraints on all possible interpretations of the world so that you can, based on these restricted interpretations, conclude new facts, entailed facts. So one example is that if we have a statement that all A are B and we have a statement that some C are A, we can also conclude that some C exist that are B. And this is something that is based on the, the, the formal interpretation of the stated knowledge by interpreting the, uh, the, the, the operators 
without knowledge of the specifics of the, the objects themselves. So it doesn't matter whether we talk about rabbits, it doesn't matter whether we talk about pets or cars, the inference is valid and is always predictable and always the same because we have assigned a value and, and a meaning to the operators all, some, and R in this case. And this allows us to conclude something about pets, rabbits, but also cars, whatever is modeled this way. So we look here into calculating with knowledge and the inferencing is the algorithmic manipulation of the knowledge in order to derive new facts, implicit facts from explicitly stated knowledge. And the meaning of the words itself is not needed. The inferencing is based on the structure of the argument and is based on the definition of the operators, the semantics, the meaning of the operators. So again, uh, this holds, this syllogism of uh, Aristotle holds for any choice of A and B and C only because of the form and only because we interpret the operators all and R in this case. And thus we have an abstract argument which we can then instantiate for the different instances like Greek and man and mortal. Calculating with knowledge thus means inferencing or reasoning. And the trick is that this is all based on formal semantics. Basically, this is an implementation of the entailment relation that we have introduced already discussed several times for formal systems in the first two weeks. And that we are also going to define for the languages that we introduce this week and next week. There is an important difference between two different actions that we can perform on data. The first one is just querying. So basically to query the web of data, uh, the data needs to be connected and needs to have a, a known model. But then the question is just that we sort of get out the information that has been modeled there. So the thing, if we want to do querying, what we can get out of it is as two bits of information, namely that all rabbits are cute and some pets are rabbits. We cannot do more. This is just getting the information that has been explicitly stated. And Sparkle is a language that only gets the things out of a database that have been explicitly modeled. If we also want to get implicit statements out of our knowledge base, we need to have the former semantics so that we also get the implicit information that is entailed by the knowledge and not necessarily explicitly in the knowledge base. And obviously the inference should be predictable. So only when we have a semantic notion assigned to the operators, all, are, some, and so forth, can we now conclude from our database, all rabbits are cute, some pets are rabbits, that there is also something that follows from these two statements, namely that some rab what is it, some pets are cute. This follows because we have to do some inference based on the formal semantics and the notion of entailment that you have already met. And this means that if we understand the notions all and are and some, and if we agree on the inference rule, this one, then whatever instantiation we give it, we all have to agree or will agree on the inference that comes out of this process. So, before we continue with this, this notion and make it concrete for the specific language of RDFS, RDF schema, let's uh, talk a bit of history because um, um, the knowledge graph idea is obviously not new. I mean, we have uh, people have thought of graphs representing knowledge with graphs before, and maybe the, the most famous or the first one to do this, uh, this uh, in, in papers is uh, Ross Quillian in uh, the 60s. Um, which was about uh, associative memory, so to link things that have a that that are associated, uh, and what came out were semantic networks, basically graphs of nodes, planes, and pointers, and they looked very similar to 
what we now have is our knowledge graphs. They have also not subclass relations, modifications, disjunction. They were very rich formalisms saying a lot of things. Um, so here you could say that um, a plant is a structure that's alive and it's an animal. Um, um, I don't really know what, oh yeah, animals are also alive and, um, and so forth. So you could specify lots of things. Um, the only problem with this was that uh, it was recognized very soon afterwards that first of all there was really not that much that one could automatically derive, so not much inference, predictable inference. There was only a weak notion of inher inheritance. Uh, but even worse, the inference was not predictable after all, because uh, the semantics was not clear. And uh, there were two papers uh, recognizing this, what's in a link by Bill Woods in the 75 and Ron Brachman, who's I think the, the probably the, the, the godfather of the this uh, knowledge uh, representation field, who also realized that without a proper semantics of the representation itself, without knowing anything about the domain and the objects that w was talked about, um, there is no real predictable inference. So we need to assign meaning to the operators of the language of this description of networks. And they came up with the, the first kind of uh, formal uh, knowledge graph, I would almost call it the structured inheritance networks, uh, KL1, um, where you really have had a, a, an assignment of uh, values to the, the properties between the concepts and instances as they defined, uh, defined them. So um, if you look at this, you will see that this already looks very, very much like um, the knowledge graphs that we talk about now, and in particular, the, the knowledge graphs that we're going to talk in, in the next module, when it's really about describing rich knowledge of uh, uh, classes and facts and instances and relations. So what became clear here that you really need to formalize the vocabulary that was used to talk about the relations between objects and classes. And this is where RDFS comes in, because we now look for a language to describe these important knowledge presentation notions of classes and relations and instances, but comes with a formal semantics. So let me remind you of the principles that we have already seen in the first week particular, we have a set of reserved symbols. So on the one hand, we have our variables or our, our resources and so forth, but we have a, a reserved set of symbols. And in propositional logic, this is the implication symbol. In the arithmetic, this was the equality or the smaller than. And in, in set theory, we have the union symbol. In the semantic networks, we have, have isa. And in RDF, this is also the RDFS, RDF type relation that is also this is abbreviated as A in a turtle, for example. And then we have variables um, that might be assigned values to, or in our case, these are the resources, a specific type of variables or blank nodes that are also variables. And then a formula. In our case, these are the triples and the graphs. Uh, they come with the, the meaning when they are true and the semantic between these formulas, which is the entailment. So now comes the, 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 the main thing about this lecture today is that obviously we want to implement now this semantic notion. We also want to think of how can we find actually whether two formulae are entailed or in our case, whether a, a, a knowledge graph is entailed by another knowledge graph. And um, basically for this, there is a, is a set of inference rules. And you have seen the syllogisms of Aristotle and the modus ponens in propositional logic, uh, which is very similar uh, already, which basically allows you to conclude um, new facts because of two statements that you've seen. So it was the all, uh, um, all pets are cued and um, there are some uh, pets that are cued um, is what you can conclude by this rule that we've seen three slides before. And um, it's very important that these inference rules have to be meaningful in the sense that they implement the meaning as it was defined in the semantics. And this is basically the f 
a, a formal subfield of logic where you prove that your inferencing corresponds to the notion of entailment. And what you then have to do is that you devise a set of formulae or axioms about the world, your knowledge base or your knowledge graph, to which the rules can be applied to. And your rules will then derive valid and tailed formula with uh, inferencing uh, and uh, if, if, if everything's well designed, uh, which it is in RDFS, then all the things that can be derived are really predictable and everybody will interpret them the same way so that every machine that you find that does RDFS will in principle produce the same results. So um, we've talked about the reserved symbols. Uh, here is the example of the, the modus ponens rule, which, um, which is basically that if you know P and you know that P implies Q, you can infer Q. This is modus ponens, but there's also a rule that you have, if you have uh, not not P, then P must be true. And you have one which says if, if P or Q is true, then not P implies Q. And these are basically um, things that you we can show by the definition definition of attainment that they are valid, but they are also rules that you can apply, rewrite rules of propositional logic. And if you apply these specific attainment relations as a rewriting, then you can build a complete inferencing uh, calculus, which allows you to write to derive all the new facts. And um, this is what we're going to show that. Um, that there is a set of inference rules for this language RDFS and that this in principle uh, allows you to calculate all the entailed formula for uh, RDFS. So here is a, a, just as an example a list of possible rules that you can apply in propositional logic and um, the question is then when you derive an algorithm that you have to find which of the left-hand side forms do I have in order to add the right-hand side um, elements. So in modus ponens, you look for atomic statements P and you look for implications P implies Q, and then you add Q to the, your knowledge base. Um, and that basically means that your inferencing and propositional logic could be, could be solved simply by searching the occurrences of the left-hand side of your these entailment rules um, and then replacing them by the right-hand side. Um, and this is then the so-called sequent calculus. It's a very simple way of, of, um, of uh, producing all the propositionally valid uh, formula or entailed formula, sorry, the entailed formula, by just applying these rules over and over again. And we see how this work in RDFS in a more uh, knowledge graph driven language. So let's uh, discuss something else, which is um, a more knowledge representation modeling question, namely what kind of knowledge can we model about graphs, about objects, about classes. And in principle, there is two different types of knowledge. The one is the generic knowledge. And the other one is the factual knowledge. So we have a schema level um, for example, that describes how the, the database is, is organized. And we have the data level where we talk about the data itself. We can also look at the world view, the, 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 the domain of the knowledge, and can talk about ontology level, about the relations between the classes of the uh, elements in our domain that is described, but also on the instance level. Usually the generic knowledge is represented by means of classes. A class denotes a set of individual objects in reality. So we talk about furniture, chairs, cars, ducks, and so forth. But a class can also be abstract. So, um, so uh, it's not only individual objects, but it can also be the class of um, um, This is not true, actually. I have to cut this out. Factual knowledge is represented by means of individuals. So an individual individual might be something, uh, an, an individual object in reality, a single object. So we look at a specific chair, a specific car, a specific duck, and so forth. And then finally, we have uh, properties that uh, represent pairs of individual object, objects in reality. 
And then the question is, what can we say about these relations? What can we say about individual objects and classes? But these are the sort of the three main tools of knowledge representation in these, uh, these, uh, for these specific problems. Uh, we want to derive generic, uh, we want to describe generic knowledge. And we usually do this by classes and relations between classes. We want to do factual knowledge. And this is usually described by individuals, relations between individuals and uh, individuals and classes. And the relations uh, can be among the classes and individuals. And then we do the same trick that we did before with the, with the uh, knowledge representation, that we have a statement which says, for example, uh, Arc de Triomphe is an instance of the concept Arc. And then we interpret this as a class of all the archers, arches, and the specific object, the Arc de Triomphe, should then be an in the class of all the arches. So basically, we um, we denote the generic concept of arch by the set of all the arches, and we denote the Arc de Triomphe individual object that we have in our database um, as a specific object that should be interpreted to be an instance of the class of arches. So formally, we have a function that assigns a value O in the domain. This is here. Um, this is, we used to, we usually uh, wrote the letter U for the universe. Here, there's a different way of annotating, uh, of, of calling the, the universe. It's called the delta I, um, but it's the same as the U that we normally use. Um, and the object should be interpreted as an object in the universe and a sub, and, and an element of the set C, which is the denotation of the class um, C, which we link with this statement, with this triple. So the RDF type combines an object O and a class C, and it should be interpreted in a way that the object O, when it's interpreted, has to be an element of the class C. So this is the same as we did um, with the knowledge graph. We had an interpretation uh, in this case, in the knowledge graphs, as an as a towards a label in a graph, and here it's denotated as an object, an element of a class. So there's a slightly different theoretical interpretation, notion of interpretation in this case. Let's see how this is a bit more in practice. We have many objects in the world. We have many uh, things in the world, like cities, countries, uh, people. Um, and uh, basically what you can do then is to sort of order these people in uh, in classes. So we have the class of cities, which is all the things that we will then denote to be cities. We have the class of houses, we have the countries, we have the men, and we have US presidents. Um, and in this case, we also have uh, things like male US presidents, which is basically the inter intersection of the US presidents and the man. Um, and basically, we also have the, the class of women and um, uh, female politicians and so forth. So there are many ways of uh, identifying um, classes for specific instances in the world. And the question of knowledge representation now is to think of languages that allow us to describe interesting relations between these instances, like what the, or the White House. Um, and how they are related and how we can derive interesting new information about it. So here are some examples of the kind of language uh, elements that we need in our language. We want to talk about conditions on class membership. We want to be able to say that all mammals are warm-blooded. We want to say that if you don't eat meat, you're a vegetarian. We want to assert property relations that um, uh, there is a relation between the Netherlands and Amsterdam that is, it has capital relation. We want to assign uh, assertions of equality. We want to say that the morning star is the same as the evening star and the same as the Venus. We want to model relations between classes. We want to be able to say that all cities are populated places or, or every class is equivalent to itself, which is a sort of meta statement about relations of classes. We also want to say uh, something about uh, class membership. We want to say which is other the, the instance of the class city. So Amsterdam is a city, Rotterdam is a city, 
Um, and finally, we want to say characteristics of properties themselves so that the has capital relation is about countries and cities and not about cats and dogs. Or that the part of the relation is transitive. So if um, A is part of B and B is part of C, that we can derive that A is part of C. These are things we want to stay so that we can derive new facts out of those. And some of those things will be, derived, will be uh, defined in RDF S, in the schema language for RDF, and some will be defined next week in the OWL language. But the idea is that we define these kind of axioms, uh, the formula that we write down in our formal language, they are the axioms that allow us to restrict the interpretations of the world. So the formulas are axioms that restrict possible interpretations of the world to the models of the knowledge base. And here you see it coming why we had to go through all the formal systems in the first week, because entailment is the core notion here. And entailment is defined as truth in these restricted interpretations, so these models. So we have again, we have the same as we had before. We describe a knowledge base with all these different language axioms, uh, axioms that we that we will introduce uh, in the next videos and in the next next module. Um, and these formulae will, in a formal way, restrict all the possible interpretations of the world, so that based on this notion of models, we can entail, we can define what it means to be. Uh, that something is entailed by a knowledge base. And based on this notion of entailment, we can also come up with inference rules, which allow us to derive exactly the things that are predictable in res with respect to the given semantics.